My next guest is a man who has many, many talents. He's a writer, director, producer, actor. He does just about everything, and I am real proud to have him on my show tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Orson Welles. Thank you. Thank you. I'd uh, like to read you a telegram. Uh, Mr. Orson Welles, Paris, France, dear Orson, I would consider it an honor if you would find the time to appear on my opening television show, Dean Martin. Well, of course, I was delighted, but I've never done this kind of show before, and I wanted to make sure I'd have enough rehearsal, so I wired back, please advise me of my rehearsal dates. And this is what I got back from Dean. Dear Orson, your rehearsal dates will be Kathy, Margie, and Roberta in that order. <laughs> That's my kind of a guy. So here I am. And I must say that in all my years in movies and on the stage, I've never seen anything quite like it, except maybe from my days in radio. I, I didn't rehearse then either. But it was for a different reason. We were doing so many shows in those days, there wasn't time to rehearse. I can remember at NBC in New York, I was acting in 30 different radio shows a week, and they had an elevator set aside just to get me from studio to studio on time. That's really true. So I was leaving the elevator, someone would throw a script in my hands and say, page 36, you're a 90-year-old cowboy. And I'd say, it's awful lonesome up here in the saddle ever since my old horse died. And back to the elevator to another studio where I'd be a doctor. I hate to disillusion you, nurse, but an apple a day will not keep me away. <laughs> and down six floors to Studio A and Fu Manchu. Oh. The cause of death was ancient Chinese murder weapon. Victim beaten to death with soggy egg roll. <laughs> and down the hall of Studio B where I was in a soap opera. You know, in that soap opera, I had a girl in the rumble seat of a car for 30 weeks. And what really went on in that rumble seat, <laughs> only the shadow knew. Oh, yes, the shadow. I was the shadow. Who knows what evil lurks in the hearts of men? The shadow knows. <laughs> Thank you, senior citizens. The shadow, which I was for my sins, may have known what was going on, but I didn't. I was too busy. They were great days. There was a lot of excitement in radio. There really was, because there was a lot of imagination in it. We could create a whole world in the mind of the listener simply by using sound effects. But on some of the big shows, there were as many as six different sound men, all running around like cooks in the Waldorf kitchen, while we actors stood quite calmly by reading our lines in the microphone. I'll never forget one day we had a blizzard in New York. Only one of the six sound men was able to get through the snow to the studio, one lone and rather sorrowful character. The whole thing was impossible. <laughs> Let me show you. The NBC Blue Network brings you another episode of Johnny Pistachio, Private Eye. The city was asleep as I returned to my apartment. Everything was quiet. <laughs> Except for the occasional sound of a tugboat in the East River. And once in a while, a taxi below my window. The tower clock was striking three. My skull throbbed from the pistol whipping I'd taken as I tossed my shoes on the floor and jumped into bed. <laughs> then it hit me. I'd left the office open, and inside that office was enough evidence to put the mob away for life. I jumped out of bed, grabbed my shoes, and uh, ran downstairs right into the middle of a thunderstorm. I uh, sloshed my way through the rain-drenched streets. When I reached my office, I opened the door slowly, slowly, and tiptoed in. There was someone coming. I heard footsteps on the stairs. A woman's footsteps.
And then she walked in the door. I have never seen a more beautiful woman in my life. She walked through the door and then she kissed me. She kissed me, but not an ordinary kiss. No, the kind of kiss a man remembers. There was a pregnant pause. She slumped to the floor, but someone had called the cops. The cops. Someone had called the cops. <laughs> I had to hide the body. The body, but where? The closet. No, out the window would be better. Out the window. Wait a minute. I'd better stick with the closet. Of course, it couldn't look like an accident if I rolled the body down the stairs. Forget it. I ran out the door and beat it down the back stairs. All three flights. <laughs> then just as the police were running down the front stairs, I somehow made it back to my apartment and flopped on the bed. <laughs> as an afterthought, I mixed myself a good short drink. Just a short one. Very important. Thank you, I needed that. You, you wore me out. <laughs> I'm afraid you'd never make it as a sound effects man, but heaven knows I tried. Orson, how about uh, trying something else? And you ask. Well, you, uh, you have a reputation as being suave, you know. Oh, I do? Yes, a man of the world. <laughs> Say, that's what I'd like to be, suave man of the world. Suave man of the world? Mm -hmm. yeah, no slouch, Dean. Well, I've had a few moments, but nothing on the grand worldwide scale like you have. Huh? Well, to be suave and the man of the world, you, you've got to... Uh, well, what do you do, for instance, when you meet a beautiful woman? Oh, I say something like, Hiya, honey, what's up there, baby? No. Huh? Well, you see, that's, uh, if you want to do it the elegant way, you should speak deeply and enunciate very clearly. How now, brown cow? Okay. Now try it again. Hiya, honey, how now, brown cow? <laughs> It's, it's also what you say that's important. Something, something romantic like this. Oh, how this spring of love resembleth the uncertain glory of an April day, which now shows all the beauty of the sun, and by and by a cloud takes all away. Ah, darn! <laughs> hey, who, who writes your material? That's beautiful! <laughs> Who writes that? A guy by the name of Billy Shakespeare does most of my stuff. Oh, oh, 